So thank you to Dr. Zokranik and Vasilio for inviting me. I appreciate the opportunity and Sages as well. And I realize I'm the only thing standing between you guys and lunch, so I'll try to keep this quick. Um, so let's see. Green button. Check. Okay. So um, I don't have any financial disclosures to list, but it is important to know that I'm a surgeon. I'm not a computer scientist. Um, haven't mastered PowerPoint yet, but we're getting there. Uh, I did have a team of folks who are computer scientists who worked on, on the work that I'm going to present now. So are we ready for the automation of FLS? And the 10 second answer, of course, is no. <laughs> the 10 minute answer, I'll show you. So the background of what I'm going to tell you is based out of a project where we were trying to come up with sort of a driver's ed system to teach the fundamentals of laparoscopic surgery uh, at a distance or nearby. Because one of the frustrations that I've heard many surgeons say is teaching laparoscopy is hard because I can't actually put my hands on the instrument. I'm, I'm forced to hand them over to somebody else, and that's difficult. So we came up with this system here that we call the, the lap robot, and it's, uh, it's, there have been many iterations of them. Uh, the current one is made out of brushed aluminum, so I think we're going to stop at this one because it's the prettiest one of the ones that we've shown so far but basically it's two drivers for a uh, for a couple of uh, actual laparoscopic instruments that we use and they are set up in a master-slave relationship and also in a cooperative relationship so that you can actually put hands on and people using it on the other end get force feedback to mimic the sorts of uh, gestures that you're doing or if they're doing something wrong you can grab the handles and drive this as well. Um, it's got a very sophisticated uh, control system design to make sure that the uh, device is accurate the whole way and can be done over a distance. Um, and this is what one end of the station looks like mounted on a breadboard. And uh, we took these two stations that we made and we planted one over at uh, Eisenhower Medical Center, which is about 100 miles east of Los Angeles. And I, I don't want to talk too much about this part because we finished our subjects. We did 50 subjects and we finished them in October, so I didn't have enough time to, or I was already past the deadline for this meeting. Hopefully next year with any luck you'll hear more about this if you're interested. So this is my, my Steven Spielberg teaser. Um, so we, we had this device and in the process of developing these systems, it became of course critically important to know where the tips of the instruments were while we were doing it. So we went back to the work of Ara Darzi and, uh, and Alfred Cuchieri and looked at some of the very early motion detection analyses they did in the early 90s when laparoscopy first started coming out. And I had my guys working on, on these the uh, shapes of, of motion detection, uh, if you will. And it's, it's easy, I'm sorry this doesn't project as well as it could, but it's easy to look at blobs of expert motion and novice motion and you get a sense that there's a pretty different character to the motion, but it's difficult to quantitate it. Um, so they started working on algorithms of ways that they could analyze the proficiency and skill of the individual user and the first iteration they came to me with was something that's actually about 10% more predictive of skill level than FLS is. And I said, whoa, <laughs> hang on a minute. And we wrote a paper on that and we published it a couple years ago. But I said, okay, wait a minute, FLS is already here and there's been 10 to 20 years worth of work going into it. It's the accepted standard. I don't think we should go trying to push FLS out of the way, plus we, we're, 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 this, we're taking too big of a bite off here. So I said, why don't you back up a little bit and why don't we take a look and see if we can look at the visual fields in the FLS system. Let's look at the box trainers and what's being done in the box trainers and see if we can analyze what's happening there. So they said, no problem. Um, so we started embarking on what is commonly referred to now as machine vision, and it's used in other industries pretty commonly, but not really in medicine as much. So one of the components of machine vision is that you can detect objects within a field and identify them. And if you look at this particular picture, these are three objects which you're all familiar with. We know what the shape of those is in our brain, but this is three different perspectives of those same shaped objects. So part of the component is teaching the software what they look like from different perspectives. And then there's a component also of doing something called color space analysis where you separate the background out from the structures themselves and try to get a silhouette or shape around the, the object of interest, which in this case is the green triangle. And then if you take those silhouettes, you can actually modify them into uh, having a simple polygon. The software can understand and process that information a lot faster than it could the actual silhouette uh, based on the optics, and then you get something that looks like this. 
So this is one of those green triangles. It's sitting on the desk of one of my students, and he just ran his camera around it, and we were able to write this algorithm so that you can detect the edges of that object pretty much from any camera angle you want. So that was step number one. So then we started saying, okay, if we want to expand this, and this is again in two dimensions, we need to teach the software to identify multiple ones of the same thing, but also discriminate between them. So in this case, we used four different colors for the peg transfer task, which you're all very familiar with, and we were able to consistently track which one was which, which is obviously important if you're doing any sort of actual interpretation of the visual field. And again, this is based on the silhouettes. So that's in two dimensions. So now that you've got the triangles going back and forth, you need to be able to incorporate what the instruments are doing. And if you look going in a uh, clockwise fashion at the first upper left corner, you see the, the original image, then you extract out the base information behind it. You can do contours around known instruments, um, and then you can fit the lines to match the contours. In the, in the bottom picture, you see the tool tips being tracked based on a contrast between the silver and the black, which is a, sort of a cheater's way to do it. And then if you put all that information together, you can get a highly reliable uh, representation of what's happening when somebody does a uh, peg transfer task on FLS. So that worked very well. So then th the next step becomes, if you've done that nicely in two dimensions, you need to represent that in a three-dimensional world because you have to have the possibility to move your camera angle around and account for differences between different box trainers and, and different cameras. So the way to go about that was to, to take, fortunately for FLS, everything is fairly consistent. So we can take a known object, which is this pegboard, which has consistent spacing between the pegs, and we can recreate that in virtual reality, teach the software what it looks like in virtual reality, and then we can consistently have images of where those pegs are, not only in two dimensions, but in three dimensions. And that becomes critical as you're going forward and moving those, those blocks around. Okay, so the next thing is, if you're gonna score a test, you need to be able to figure out when something goes wrong. So if you look at m most users when they're doing the peg transfer task, they're sort of slow in the beginning, and if the higher their skill level, the faster they get in general. Uh, but their movements are purposeful, even in the most rudimentary novice, in fact, probably more so. And one of the ways that you can detect an error, if drop is considered an error, is an abrupt change in the velocity of a known object. We've taught the software what the thing is, we've taught where it is, we've taught it three dimensions, and now we're gonna teach it, okay, this sort of a move almost certainly, you know, with a very high degree of probability, represents a drop because it's, it's a, a rapid change in the velocity. So that amounted to this video, which is, this is, uh, it's not exactly what you do in a peg transfer, but we wanted to drop and see if the software would pick it up, and uh, it did fairly consistently. The one downside to this particular um, analysis was that we had, it was a little bit oversensitive. So we had about 85% accuracy. You'll see a couple of blips there that shouldn't be there based on what you're looking at on the, uh, the video screen here. But this was consistent, and uh, we were very proud of that, and the, the student who was working on it got his PhD, and off he went. So he went radio silent for a little while, as I'm sure you've all experienced if you do any sort of research with graduate students. So um, uh, we revived it again, finally, he went off. I'm, I'm tempted during their thesis committees to fail them just because I wanna keep them for like one more year, or two more years. I mean, the, the carrot that I've used, we were talking about carrots and sticks, the carrot I've used successfully many times is, is offering them a postdoc position with an indeterminate amount of time, but um, that doesn't always work, so it didn't in this case. So we've, we've hired on a new graduate student, and he's noted that there was some, the reason we were 85% and not 100% um, effective in, the, in these studies was because of things like illumination changes would affect our accuracy. Um, and there was problems if the blocks overlapped. If they were the same color, it was difficult for the software to discriminate between them. And if the block was actually on the peg, which it has to be in order to do the procedure correctly, that was uh, sometimes a source for error. So um, we've, we've written a new set of algorithms for the same software, and we've actually figured out a way to name the individual pegs relative to the software, and we've uh, figured out a way to do this with only two colors, and to actually track what the task is supposed to do, which is passing all the pegs from one side and back to the other, and it's a very robust system, 
with close to 100% accuracy now. So we're ready to take this to the next level. Um, I'll quickly go through something else we did. When I showed you that contraption before we did the study, we had 50 subjects and my research assistant came to me and said, I've got all these circles and it's gonna take me forever to calculate what the errors are in the way that's traditionally done for FLS. Uh, because whether or not you're aware of this, for things like the circle cut, they're actually put in an envelope and sent off to a sweatshop where we have a bunch of four-year-olds <laughs> calculating. And you, you laugh about the four-year-olds. I don't mean to joke about child labor, but the funny part is four-year-olds happen to be the world's experts on coloring outside of the line. So that's what happens currently. We decided we could do it with a machine. So what we do is once, once the, uh, the user has the circle, we put it down and calculate the, the area and base that on what the ideal area should be for that particular circle size and using a very simple formula, if you happen to be a math PhD, is that one there. And then we can figure out what the deviation is from what the standard expectation should be. And if you look at these two, and then we score them. If you look at these two, the image on the left is a 97% score versus an 85% on the right. So we were able to do that with basically 100% accuracy every time. That was meant for labor saving, but it turned out to be probably a good way to do it. And what we're envisioning for these, these uh, trials going forward is that there are about 1,500 FLS practical exams administered every year, and there's a cost associated with that. And one of the costs is UCLA is a, is a FLS testing center, so we get paid $75 for every examinee who comes through and takes the test, but that, of course, doesn't cover our cost. For any of those who, of you who do this, you know that $75 is nice and we're happy for it, uh, but it doesn't cover the cost. So if we could eliminate some parts of this by having this available online, for example, there would be a huge reduction in the infrastructural costs associated with making FLS available without having to change any of the equipment that we use now. We can use all the same box trainers, all the same equipment, all the same cameras, everything. It's about a $70,000 per year uh, uh, cost. And then the biggest thing is that we know that there's uh, immediate feedback improves performance that's well established. And the other thing is that uh, right now FLS and SAGES is pre uh, pushing established surgeons to become FLS certified. Uh, as, and that started last year with the ACS and SAGES joint statement. And we feel that this reduction in hassle, if you will, will maybe um, lower the barriers. So next steps, we just submitted an IRB and we plan to actually test our software head to head with an actual proctor in a blinded fashion. Uh, we'll probably have that study by the end of the month and then we're, if we get good data, we'll submit for funding and expand this out to all five, parentheses seven, for those of you who are familiar. Um, FLS practical tests and hopefully we'll have something available for you online soon. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge my team, very, very uh, large team who worked on this at CASIT and also Tatrick who helped fund the initial uh, uh, studies. Thank you. Thank you.